So today's online presentation focuses on the politics of Quebec, featuring insights from Dr. Guy LaChapelle, uh, who's a professor in the Department of Political Science at Concordia University. He's currently uh, the elected Secretary General of the International Political Science Association, IPSA, which is based at Concordia University. His publications include contributions to a whole raft of journals, including Publius, uh, the Journal of Canadian Political Science, and several others, and he's often solicited uh, by the media to comment on Canadian and American political scenes. So we're very fortunate to have you here with us tonight, and I'll turn the floor over to you to talk about Quebec politics. I'd also just remind folks that are tuning in online, either live or afterwards, to head over to our uh, blog, which is provincialpolitics.blogspot.ca, where you can join the discussion, ask questions, and so on. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Guy. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jared. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I understand that uh, quite often Quebec politics uh, seen from Alberta or from the western provinces is probably not in the headlines all the time. So uh, so let me just refresh you with maybe some events, I think, historically that are still uh, based on the political discussion in Quebec. Uh, I think the first one, which, which is an important date in Canadian history, is of course the patriation of the Constitution in 1982. Uh, the fact that Quebec never signed the Keynesian Constitution and all the, the dealing uh, over this uh, uh, disagreement, I think uh, everybody was, are still in all political party are still puzzled in a way. How can Quebec uh, become uh, re rejoin in some way Canada and be part of the Constitution? Uh, this is a question that everybody frequently are asking me worldwide. Uh, how a, a part of a country can cannot have signed the Constitution, even if uh, constitutionally it's, it's, uh, it doesn't seem to make a lot of differences. And this is the uh, second question, is, uh, does it really matter? But, uh, but beyond that, I think there's a question of legitimacy beyond that. Uh, the former uh, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, Benoit Pelletier, did try to, through his Council of the Federation, uh, to, to find a way that uh, the other provinces can recognize Quebec within the Constitution. So this is in the background, I would say, from uh, uh, back to, to that period of 1982 and the early 80s. Uh, of course, after that, Quebec had two referendums. Uh, well, we had the one on Charlottetown, of course, and that was a failure. And, uh, and for many people, I think the, uh, it, it, was, it was, in a way, uh, a kind of mismatch of so many things where at the beginning the in only thing was to that Quebec reintegrate uh, uh, the Canadian Federation and that was the word of Mr. Mulroney really and Mr. Barassa in Quebec. They were really too fearless who really wanted desperately that that there is an agreement coming out of that but Charlottetown was uh, in this, well in many ways there were so many issues involved especially in the process because there was too many people around the table and the native issue uh, uh, a lot of other energy policy and all of these issues came back and, and, and the referendum was fought on different grounds in each provinces. Uh, of course, then the 95 referendum uh, in Quebec. I think we are still living, uh, unfortunately, I will say, in the aftermath of this referendum. Uh, that was the worst scenario, I will say, politically, because when you have an outcome of 50-50, uh, two parties neck to neck, uh, uh, it means that there is no decision that has been made, and, and that's the difficulty. Uh, the federal government perceived that as a, a big loss. Mr. Kretzian was on the edge on that issue, and that's why he brought Mr. Dion and, and this Clarity Act, because he knew the rest of Canada were judging him and saying that he really failed in trying uh, to win this referendum. And on the Quebec side, the politician uh, didn't know what to do after that, essentially. Uh, uh, they just wanted to put that on the back burner, all the political and constitutional discussion, or even uh, on the question of the separation of powers or the, the division of power between provinces. So, so since that, I would say, the, and it's almost 20 years, so this, it is a, a kind of a leftover or a issue that is not on the air. So, so the, the other things I think during that period what became, I think, more prominent for all political parties is the uh, implementation of the free trade agreement. Uh, as you know, Quebec, Alberta, were very strong believers that we should have a closer tie, uh, economic tie, with the United States. And most parties, uh, uh, with the Liberal Party in Quebec, the party group, but they were all support supporters of, the, of this free trade agreement. 
Uh, just last week was the conference of the new, uh, the governor of New England and the premier of Eastern Canada that was in Rhode Island. And uh, Mr. Couillard, our actual prime, uh, premier or prime minister, uh, just continued to uh, to pursue his, uh, his idea that uh, there should be more uh, trade and uh, with the U.S. and mainly with the with the energy uh, question uh, that Quebec should sell more electricity to to the American people. So uh, so I think we came back a kind of politics where where the the economy dominated the agenda over the last uh, uh, two decades and uh, and and the very few things were really uh, uh, really discussed. Uh, I, I will probably say that Quebec be, just came uh, after all of these uh, discussion, and it's just a province like the other provinces now. Uh, there's no real uh, demand. Even if Mrs. Mawa was elected and was uh, the premier for 18 months only, uh, uh, the, the the discussion was not on sovereignty. The discussion was more on other type of uh, social policy and or health policy. So the domination is the fiscal crisis. It's fiscal feralism in Canada. Uh, even a concept like uh, that was uh, that Quebec pushed for it, the fiscal disequilibrium in Canada, how we can redistribute uh, uh, the federal money through the transfer payment to the rich and poor provinces is always a, an issue uh, in general. I think Quebec did in fact do receive uh, uh, some money, but they do give a lot of money. And uh, of course, it's not only when we calculate that, it's not only the transfer payment, it's also the investment made through the discretionary budget of the federal governments. Um, that we have to take into account. The, the federal government cannot just uh, take all the, can transfer money to provinces and uh, and we know Ontario has became over the recent year and have not province receiving also transfer payment where Newfoundland for many years was uh, uh, was uh, was receiving the transfer payment. But, but because of the federal investment like in energy and uh, in Newfoundland, all of these things there was a kind of imbalance now that has, has still, but this issue I think is still on the air. I think nobody wants to push or talk about it, even if it's a liberal or the PQ government, it doesn't make a, a lot of difference. So we are now in a different uh, era, I will say, at the beginning of this century. I think the the effect of globalization on gun, on government, I think, uh, uh, is 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 important, but government don't know exactly what to do with it and uh, that's why I, 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 my interpretation I have a feeling that many many provincial leaders are, are becoming more and more parochial and even states because the state seems to become stateless in the sense that there's they, they are not doing a lot of things on neither on the international scenes or or be part of a, a big uh, international issue however you might argue like on the environment which has probably one sector that I Dominated the the Kyoto Accord, uh, uh, the, the 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 energy policy with the U.S. All of these issues are important, and we are we are back on this sense to a kind of very uh, uh, down the earth policy where we are a government are not there to to come up with big project or or to bring people to, with new ideas. So so we have a lot of difficulty, I think, uh, now in our world of uh, uh, of course we sh we cannot forget the uh, the uh, September 11 in New York, uh, what happened uh, at the time, uh, that completely also changed the mindset of people in many parts of the world. And we have seen everywhere also a kind of a rise of a rightist and or populist government, which which we saw also, I think, a bit beyond the uh, the charter of values from the Quebec governments. I think some people were a bit afraid by, by the, the, the new fabric, I will say, of the society with new immigrants coming in. So. So all society are in the same uh, problem, Canada, with multiculturalism. In Quebec, it's called interculturalism. So th this is real, real, uh, real social issue that uh, that we have to face. Uh, I, I I prefer to look forward in general. Uh, uh, what should be done? Where we should go? Uh, where Quebec will be? I think that's that's certainly a very important. Uh, a question. Now we have a more stable government, having a majority government. The last one was a minority government. Uh, many civil servants didn't know exactly what to do. It's very difficult for, for bureaucrats when you have minority governments. They were very puzzled and they were always waiting of making decisions. So, but we will be probably with the, the now a more stable government. There's, uh, but, but 
but the, the, again, the, the last campaign was essentially fought on very local issues. Uh, there was no uh, uh, big parliamentary issue. International issues are never part of a of a provincial campaign. And in Quebec, we didn't even mention that uh, no parties have a real section in their platform about the international issues. And uh, so, so we we have to. I think rethink the way government works. Uh, we need better governments. Of course, the issue of uh, corruption, uh, mismanagement, uh, it's all over in all places in the world. So uh, there is one explanation also beyond that is, um, is, is, is in the last 20 years, we have seen the private sector entering governments. And this is what we we're calling corporate governments. Um, uh, the government tried to give uh, to the private sector a lot of responsibility in evaluating programs. Uh, uh, that was called new public management, but I think it's more than simply public management. I think it's a, it's really the, the, the close link and the close tie between political parties and corporate people. And that has affected, I would say, the way politicians see the world, see how they can better serve uh, citizens. And they've been, in, in many sense, I think, uh, cut or taken by some interest group which are dominating politics and uh, uh, and we're taking about the, the, the lobby of the doctors and all of these uh, associations they are really really strong in Canada more than before I think we imported that from the US and that's uh, something that we have to, uh, to question because it's the integrity of governments and all over I think which remain important and in Quebec we have seen that the, 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 the Commission uh, the Charbonne Commission and and it's it started ten years with the government commissions on the federal subsidies during the referendum and to companies uh, the, uh, the the all of those commission that came out and uh, uh, just raised questions on the on how parties are financed and how 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 government can really be uh, uh, serving the interests of everyone. So so we are in a period I think usually. Uh, uh, where there's a kind of adaptation now f uh, for government to uh, to reorganize themselves to be more, I would say, a, a better focus on on the needs of citizens. And uh, uh, what is troubling, I think, everyone in Canada, I think, is now when you have a budget where half half of a cent or 50 50 percent of your budget go to health care, there's very little left for culture, uh, uh, international relation, and all the others. So it it it. The government are becoming more and more fiscally dependent, I would say, on, on, on those resources. And uh, uh, so in Montreal, for example, we have now they're they are building these two big new hospitals. I think that led to a different uh, contract done with the private sectors and others. So so the life in Montreal is still very nice beyond maybe what I've said. Uh, it's a lively city and there's a lot of things going on in Quebec City is the same and in the region, but of course as in most provinces, uh, the, the main the jobs are in the center, and uh, and the region do suffer. Mr. Cuyar, Mr. Share before, and Mrs. Mawad, they were both trying, thinking about the, the, the their project about the north to develop more the nor uh, northern part of Quebec, and and to do that in collaboration with the native people. Uh, there's a very very uh, close tie now, I think, and that's why you didn't heard a lot of things about any conflict between native people and governments or. Uh, because since uh, Mr. Landry, as a premier, signed this, uh, what was called the Braveheart uh, Treaty, the Pedi Brave, I think, uh, there was a, a long-term agreement in terms of uh, economic development uh, of the North in collaboration with the Native people. And I think uh, th there's still a lot of social and health issues which are uh, still very important for, for those communities. But uh, but I think the, the all Quebec government has been very much... Uh, uh, involved in that, and the project of Mr. Shaw is to develop our natural resources. Uh, of course, there's more pressure from uh, worldwide of getting uh, those resources, uh, iron and others in the north. At the same time, to develop the Saint Lawrence Seaway as a as as a, and the project in terms of uh, of uh, opening our uh, Saint Lawrence to be able to and to export things and 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 also in terms of trades and uh, making that. Uh, a kind of an important leverage in terms of negotiations uh, and for future trade with different countries. So, so we are in that period. I think the thing we are we are going to face a larger globalization process, uh, and and I think against I think states and provinces and regions that are playing will play a major role in the future.
uh, each one has to adapt itself to the, this new reality. And this is why we have seen more and more uh, international actors, uh, local government, municipal government, are much more involved in, in world politics now than before. Uh, this is the concept with, uh, that we work on uh, with colleagues in the U.S. Uh, and in Europe about the role of uh, what we call the para-diplomacy beyond the official diplomacy of states. There is these kind of activities going on which are under the radar but are still very, very important. And uh, attracting a world congress, all of these kind of activities are, are now part of uh, for most government. And it's an important source of income of bring people over here. So, uh, so this is the other phenomenon that we, I would say, observe now, that there's more actors locally, nationally, internationally, uh, which are involved in international relations. So I think this is uh, uh, your probably last question, where Canada will be or what kind of relationship are we going to see in the future between the provinces? Um, uh, uh, about that, I don't know. I think you need a kind of leadership at the center that somebody will be interested of, uh, of changing the, the way uh, Canada is structured or the kind of division of power. Uh, I always have in mind that the proposal by Mr. Bennett, former Premier of uh, British Columbia, it was back in the uh, 79 time where he said Canada should have five regions and with five governments essentially which collaborate between each other based on the Nordic models or a kind of European model. That was the model of Mr. Lévesque as well. Uh, I think he was a visionary in that sense that Canada uh, the, and maybe North America will probably follow the European model maybe in the future. Uh, so that's a kind of, a, I would think, step-by-step -step process. Maybe we are just at the beginning of seeing what will happen, as we have seen Europe uh, develop since the 1960s, and maybe North America will have its own structure. Without for, should not forget about Mexico, even if uh, we have not been very successful, say, in our free trade agreement with, uh, with Mexico and Latin America. So. So Canada has to probably, and Canadian together, I think we have to, to find new ways of collaborations uh, in respect of the specific culture of each one. And, uh, and uh, that's why I'm always optimistic. I think people have always a way uh, to find their, to fill out their dream and be able to, to, uh, to, to get uh, something out of their governments and, and, and hoping the government will be in that sense uh, uh, more effective. Uh, it, the problem of corruption, the problem of integrity, I think is still a very important one. Uh, we launched a project at Ipsa on, on electoral integrity uh, because of that, and, and the kind of evaluation of the quality of the election everywhere in the world, and uh, that's part of our, I think, mission as, as Ipsa and, and with colleagues that we are concerned that uh, that the word democracy means something, and it has, and we have to give him a sense uh, uh, when we talk about. Uh, democratic ruling in our countries or everywhere in the world. I think that that's fundamental and we have to continue to do that. I stop here. I already take 20 minutes, so uh, uh, I'm up for any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. Perfect. Thanks, Guy. And um, I guess my, my first question is, is something that you said off the top that, that caught me a little bit by surprise. And I, I'm, I'm par paraphrasing a bit here, but you said now you feel like Quebec is a province like like most others. And I'm wondering if you can expand a bit on that and and explain to us a bit about why why you think that is. What are some of the factors that are driving Quebec to be uh, more like other provinces and, and what did you mean by that? Well, essentially uh, by 2018, which will be the next provincial elections, uh, it means that over that period we all almost have uh, uh, what, uh, 12, 13 years of liberal governments in Quebec. So it, it, it these, uh, Mr. Shara was there from 2003 uh, until the, the last elections uh, the before, and then Mr. Kouyar just took over. They're just, in, since 2003 and 2018, or during that 15 year period, we will have seen the PQ only in power for 18 months. So, so it has an impact. It has an impact on, the, on where people were saying, well, uh, we, we have good governments, uh, we have governments who are efficient, who are maybe more. Uh, Prone to look over the, uh, the the financial crisis and and to administer healthcare. So th this is what I'm saying because the the essentially the the sovereignty issue has been put in the back burner. Uh, many criticism of among the rank and file of, uh, of the PQ uh, about Mrs. Mawa Garman was that she never talked about the uh, the sovereignty project, which is the first uh, article in that platform. Uh, but it seems that it was a kind of a 
people are starting to ask, is, is it a valid, uh, uh, a valid project and, and why Quebec should be independent? So in, in a sense, we're a bit back to square one, where, where Mr. Levesque started that in 1970. So this is the impression I think most people have, say, uh, nobody is ready to take uh, and, and run with the flag over that issue. I think now uh, most of the issue are very against provincial issue uh, that can be shared by everyone. Uh, there's no big debates on, on the question of uh, Quebec being a distinct society. I think most Quebecers already think they are a distinct society and they don't think they have to fight for that. I think this is why uh, I think there's no big, uh, uh, n no real interest of reopening the constitution on, on, uh, on a single clause about the distinct society. I think uh, personally, I was, I don't think that I was opposed to the distinct society clause. I don't think it would probably have added anything. However, retrospectively, uh, of course, it's what is more important is the other four, four elements of the Michel Accord, control over immigration, then the naming of the judges of the Supreme Court. I think that's important. All government always agree on that. Uh, the language policy and uh, some of those issues are more important than simply uh, arguing about a distinct society. All, all provinces are distinct in a way. So, so that's, that's I, I think maybe there's an evolution. I think people have matured over that. I'm not saying that the sovereignty issue is on the back burner. There's still 35, 38 percent of the poll who are supporting that. So what I'm simply saying is that we are not talking about it, and uh, and because of a, a liberal party in power, uh, because the PQ has not really took the lead over that, and uh, and 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 the ball is more now in in the end of the interest group. Uh, the Bloc Québécois just elected a new leader. Of course, the next round is the federal election, and uh, and the Bloc, the new leader, want to focus only on that, essentially on independence. Uh, so. Uh, uh, so that's important. I, I think people are still watching, for example, the referendum in Scotland on September 18th. Uh, many Quebecers will be there to watch and see what's going on and, uh, and, and, and to look about the implication of this referendum or, in, or in the same in Catalonia. I think this is other models where people are still, or I would say the new generation now of politicians in Quebec uh, uh, are looking. Uh, uh, and and we, we see this change of the guard. I think maybe the, the new generation among the PQ supporter or even the liberal supporter are uh, saying, well, there has been some policies in the past. It didn't work. Uh, we had two referendum. It failed. So what kind of model, what, how can we uh, proceed and, and, and evolve as a society and not stay uh, at the same place all the time that we have to move on? And, and this is the question. And I think many young voters now are saying, well, maybe the PQ is not exactly the model we want. Maybe this other type of model. So. So I think we are in that period uh, where uh, I, I don't think this is only a question of generations. Like me, my colleague Vincent Lemieux always said that the PQ was a party of one generation. I don't think so. I think that the overall, since the 70s, I think that the polls are indicating all the time that there's a strong uh, number of people who are supporting uh, this idea. Of course, in the recent years, more the sovereignist voter has been become more older in, in the polls. Probably over 45 in general, but uh, but it's still young people who are still engaged in that. For the liberal parties, the same politics in general doesn't seem to interest. Uh, the best the best indicator is the number of mem the membership of parties uh, for both the PQ and the Liberals under 70,000. So it's probably among the lowest that we've ever seen in history. So so there's no real interest even about young voters to join par parties and and seeing that parties can make a difference in their in their career, their life, or or they have an interest. So. Uh, uh, of course, we will have a federal election. It will be Mr. Harper. Uh, Justin Trudeau is appealing. Mr. Mulcair, the NDP, is still, uh, I say, uh, the, the, the PQ, the, well, Quebec voter voted for Jack Layton. They didn't vote for the NDP last time. So I'm not sure they are going to vote for Mr. Mulcair this time. And the bloc will be there as well. So so it's, it's a, but the Mr. Trudeau, of course, being a Quebecer, being uh, uh, the son, of course, of Pierre Trudeau, I think, uh, Yes, probably a little edge as we've seen in, in, in the in the poll. So, uh, so we are coming back to that kind of, let's say, of uh, uh, Quebecers voting one way at the federal level and voting a different way at the Quebec uh, level. So, uh, so maybe this this is the two heads of the of Quebec politics. Okay, and I, I just I, I want to push you just a bit on on the underlying causes. Then, so if if Quebec if Quebec's becoming a province like all others when it comes to um, party politics being revolving around provincial issues, um, 
in some instances, I'd argue left and right, uh, maybe the dominant cleavage in the province now, which, which does mirror what we see in other provinces as well. Um, what, I guess, what forces have combined to push sovereignty off of the front burner? So um, is it, you, like you, you mentioned a lot of the, the grievances that were brought up in the Meech Lake round and those originated with uh, Burasa's five demands in 86. Mm -hmm. You can date them even further back into the Levesque era as well. I mean, they've been addressed to a certain extent. So are we saying that, that part of this is due to the fact that the um, federal government and in some cases other provinces have, have you know, assuaged some of those concerns? Uh, you said it's not so much a generational thing. I guess I'm just trying to understand what are the what are the long-term forces that are that are pushing sovereignty off of the front burner because we've seen it gradually since 1995. Yeah. Well, yeah, in, in part. Well, um, again, for me, the main the main reason and the first one is, uh, of course, because of kind of the domination of the liberal agenda over the last 15, 15 years essentially. I think that that was important. Uh, the grievances from Quebec are not are still there. I don't think uh, that the five uh, demand from Mr. Barassa has been fulfilled by the federal government. I think the question on there, if you look up the five again, I think there are still grievance, and I think uh, the Liberal Party, both the Liberal and the PQ, when they are in power, they always saying that uh, that they should back on that and they should, things should be done. However, they were not uh, proactive. I would say. Uh, they were not participating fully, I will say, on the intergovernmental relationship with the federal government. They were more interested of in getting the money back on transfer payment, the health care uh, issue. I think those issues were more important. And, and in few cases, of course, uh, Quebec won at the Supreme Court on some decision like on the judges, the Supreme nomination of judges at the Supreme Court and things like that. But it's, it's really on the edge. I don't think there's a real, real interest uh, by a provincial politician to... Uh, because I think they feel that probably that's, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm not just only talking about sovereign, I'm talking about even re reforming federalism. Uh, the Liberal Party has in this program uh, uh, this, this, this element of saying that the, the Keynesian federalism should be reformed, and they compare it to what's happening in Australia and other federal state, that something should be done. But there's no interest. And since there's no interest in the other provinces, uh, the most the premiers in Quebec that have really no interest to push on that, and that was the difficulty of uh, of a Mr. Peltier, who is a liberal, and uh, and and trying to convince his colleague that something should be done, but there's no nobody at the table. So so I think the point now is that people have decided the rest of Canada well, or either Quebec will leave and we don't care, or probably that uh, we don't want to enter in that kind of against of a trauma because we have seen a generation. Uh, we have been, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, all by this debate, and we don't want to get in this debate again. And it really divided a lot of families and everything as usual. But uh, but again, those issues are not dead. I think there are still live, lively people are talking about it. If you read newspaper in general, there is uh, there's always comment on that, and uh, what should be the status of Quebec within Canada. Uh, so it's there. It's, uh, it's, it's the fire... Uh, uh, under the the soil, I think I, I, it's 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 there, but we don't know who will catch on that and who will be able to to bring the, the this issue back. Uh, uh, and, and okay, that that's for me. That's probably one of the main cause of that. Uh, no interest, I will say, among politicians of of jumping on, on the political scenes and and also to propose any form of reforms. Uh, um, uh, you need to dance. You need two dancers, and in this case, Quebec. Politicians don't feel that they have anybody with who, the, who will be interested to talk about that. They are more interested about a pipeline, like Mr. Marois did, with Alberta crossing Canada and that to be reversed and coming to Montreal. That's something that interests, I would say, more political parties. Uh, the, the the job job issue, I think, is is fundamental, and uh, and 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 the economy dominated more the agenda than I would say political issue. So uh, uh, division. Um, is it because uh, uh, Mr. Harper, of course, doesn't have any support from Quebec? And also, that's maybe another factor. When you have a federal leaders who have no support and no political interests, uh, that also uh, means that whatever you do, I don't think you might you will get a, 
a lot of support whatever you bring to the table. So I, I that's also play. Uh, uh, I was in the last and Ms. Mr. Shari being also a uh, former premier coming from the conservative family. Uh, Mr. Shari had no real interest at the beginning really to go and talk uh, with the conservative government. I think he put that uh, really in the end and he, Mr. Pelletier didn't get the support he was expected from, from uh, Mr. Shari and bring more issue and asking for more at uh, the federal government. So, so the point is that the nationalist wing of the liberals has been a bit wiped out by the more traditional fearless who say uh, that we have we shouldn't change nothing in, in the constitution. However, if if there's a battle, we will be there. But uh, let's wait on it. Uh, you have like Senator Rive, who has been nominated by Mr. Mulroney, who is part of this nationalist wing, who would continue, I would say, the federal level to try to to serve the Quebec interests first and uh, and and try to get more money and more issues. So so we are really on the needy greedy stuff. Uh, when I said it's like the other provinces, because in the other provinces you don't have these sovereignty questions. It's all business as usual, and this is where we are essentially in Quebec, I would say, in the last 10 years. Okay, and good. I'd like to take a couple questions from, from our from our blog, and yes. one of them relates to what you were talking about um, just a few minutes ago and about um, how sovereignty has, has been kind of, again, pushed onto the back burner a bit, and um, we've had a recent government change in, in Quebec. How do you foresee those two things affecting the uh, relationship between Ottawa and Quebec City? Are we likely to see a thawing of, of tensions between the two governments? Or um, how, how do you foresee Couillard and, and Harper working together on things like transfer payments in particular? Well, Mr. Couillard and Mr. Harper have to work together. I think there's no question. Uh, uh, the question of bridges in Montreal. Montreal. Uh, it's a unique city in Canada. It's a city with with bridges to come to the islands of Montreal, uh, and and we have several bridges which are under federal jurisdictions, and which means that the federal government has to pay and uh, rebuild those bridges. and uh, And Mr. Harper wanted even to get back the bridges to to the Quebec government, of course, uh, without money. So uh, people were a bit uh, say, wait a minute, it's not just uh, you don't give us that kind of a gift. It's not a gift. It's uh, you have to pay for those kind of things. So Mr. Couillard and Mr. Harper, I think they will, they have a lot of issue, I think, in, or in common. I don't think that, uh, we should not forget we have a third party in Quebec in the last two elections, uh, La Coalition Avenir Québec on Mr. Legault. Mr. Legault was a member and minister under the Parti the part Québécois and created with the ADQ of Mario Dumont this kind of uh, middle ground party as well. So, so this party has, is much closer to Mr. Harper. Uh, in terms of ideology, in terms of uh, program, uh, Mr. Couillard will be very careful in the next until the next federal election. He has more sympathy, of course, to our Liberal Party and to Mr. Trudeau. So he probably will not want to alienate too much the Conservative governments that, in that way. So, so probably the Liberal troop will work, of course, for Mr. Trudeau in the last, uh, the next federal elections. So, but but on all the other issue, I think there is disagreement, of course, on uh, on uh, on on, well, some energy policy. Quebec has a different energy policy than Alberta. Uh, uh, so the difficulty is having a kind of a one federal policy for all provinces in Canada. Uh, uh, I, that's really becoming less and less possible, I think, in general. So there, there's more agreement, Canada, Alberta, or Canada, Quebec, that we have seen in the last 20 years. That they are just growing. So, so the federal government really negotiate by province now and cannot come out with a real uh, project throughout Canada. I think uh, uh, so. So with Mr. Mr. Harper, uh, I think uh, most Quebecers disagree with this investment in in, uh, in military and uh, in defense. Uh, uh, maybe on those kind of ground, for example, the development of the north. That's something that the federal government, Mr. Harper and Mr. Couillard, might might be on the same line. How can we develop and, and, and get the resources from the north and share those resources and have the possibility? So, so it's I would say it's it's by five by files that the the, the discussion would go on and uh, and, and again, health care is mainly the transfer payment from the federal government on health care that would probably might be an issue, uh, but uh, there is very there will be less and not, I don't see a lot of controversy um, as we have seen, uh, Mr. Couillard. Uh, was a minister under Mr. Charest, and I think he is probably 
continue on the same line. However, um, uh, as he said on all of his speeches, uh, uh, essentially you, you, you want politics to come back to, to the fundamentals, I would say, to, uh, which is essentially that having an equilibrium budget. Uh, next, this, his first budget was, uh, uh, most observer were saying this was, it, it was just a transition budget, but the difficult news for Quebecer will be next year. So until that, I think now he has to clean the house first, and uh, and that is his main promise. So I don't see a lot of uh, of uh, big discussion or fight with the federal government on, on those issues. Okay, and I'm gonna we've got a lot of questions on our blog, and again, I point people to provincial provincialpolitics.blogspot.ca to carry on this discussion. I'm gonna tie a bunch of them together, and they all focus on the structure of the party systems in Quebec. So uh, at the provincial level, you mentioned uh, the Coalition uh, d'Avenir de Québec um, and, and its prospects following the last election. I think most folks in that party were a bit disappointed with the election results. Mm -hmm. There are other minor parties there as well, um, Quebec, Quebec Solidaire and others. Um, and, and then at the federal level, uh, with, with some changes, as you mentioned very briefly in your remarks, the, uh, the success of the New Democrats, you attribute that mostly to, to the Jack Layton effect and question whether Tom, Thomas Mulcair can, can continue on with that. Is, is Quebec's uh, party system at either the provincial or, or the federal level, is it still in flux? Are we, are we seeing some kind of a settling? Are some of these parties, um, you know, what do, what do you make, I guess, of the future of the Quebec party system at the provincial level and uh, at the federal level? I know that's a broad question, but, but for those of us from the outside, it, it's difficult to make sense. Yeah, uh, no, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. I think, I think we have, we just won, uh, we were a B-party system for years, I think, essentially. Uh, so the, the, the Liberals have been there forever, back to the, the, uh, the the Confederation in 1867. Uh, the PQ was able in the 70s to take over the Union Nationale of Mr. Duplessis, the right-wing party, a bit of more conservative of the, uh, that we had in Quebec, and the PQ was able to... Uh, the Party Québécois is a coalition against a right-wing, left-wing nationalist who wanted to, together to build a Quebec state, essentially, and make Quebec government more stronger. Uh, so in, in the recent year, what we have seen is a kind of divisions. Uh, uh, the after the the failure of Meech, you had Mario Dumont, who was the young leader of the Liberal Party, the young, the wing of the Liberal Party, and and he created this this ADQ, uh, which he, he supported the, the 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 proposal of sovereignty partnership, uh, which is in a sense at the time was perceived by some people as a kind of a a, a, a new form of uh, sovereignty with feudalism, a kind of a mixed European model. So for parties like uh, the ADQ was uh, uh, an outgrowth of the Liberal Party. Uh, Mr. Legault uh, became leader, but Mr. Legault led the, the he, is, he represent a bit the light, left, uh, the right wing of the PQ. So he is a businessman, he has been involved, he is minister, uh, uh, he was uh, very much active in the government of talking about budget and, and balancing budget and everything. So he left the PQ because he was unsatisfied and uh, especially because of that, that kind of angle, he wanted the PQ to be more center-right. Uh, but mm, the rank and file parties say, no, no, we should remain more central, more social Democrats. So, so the, and you had also Quebec Solidaire, as you mentioned, who are sovereignists. This is a sovereignist party, uh, which is ba mainly based in Montreal. They, they have no, really, uh, no real supporter outside of Montreal. So, so politics in Quebec is highly divided. We are in a multi-party system now. Uh, but party, uh, I would say, any of these parties have uh, national support. All party, their, their vote are very local, uh, regional, and, and they get their majority really, uh, like the liberal group, everybody was surprised that they were able to get a majority, but they got a majority on the outskirts of Montreal and uh, Laval and, and the South Shore, where they were able to to get a candidate elected because of the strength of the ADQ and uh, and the CAC, essentially the CAC, uh, Mr. Legault, who was able to capture a lot of votes there. So 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 politics is quite divided. There's a we see this. I would say in a sense a kind of a uh, right wing, uh, left wing, uh, very on the left, and 
and the liberal remain in the center and the PQ a little bit more center left. So, so this is this is the that kind of uh, uh, party politics, brokerage politics, maybe in the sense that where where all parties have different ideas and they are pushing for that. The strange thing of that, I would say, the liberals are the only real fearless party. Um, uh, the LACAC with Mr. Legault and, uh, and the, the merging with the LAQ, here you have a mixed bag of sovereignists and fearless. Uh, the PQ, of course, this is all sovereignist. And Quebec Solidaire is a sovereignist party. So it, it's interesting to see that the sovereignist vote, in a way, is divided among three parties, but we have one party which is liberal. So, so that, that's, that's, the, that's the puzzle of politics now in Quebec, uh, uh, moving from a, a bipartisan to a multi-party. People, some people say, oh, the PQ will disappear. I think that's a that's a dream for those who want to dream about that. I don't think the party Quebecois will disappear. Uh, uh, the small party might disappear, but uh, as we know, politics is highly polarized, and usually that's uh, and 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 for Lacac, Lacac is main support is from Quebec City, uh, where they have been uh, uh, because the ADQ is coming from there. Many of their candidates have been elected there, so it's a kind of regional politics, and this is this is why it's strange in the. Uh, when I said there's no real national party, uh, all at their support in, in different regions. Uh, uh, contrary to what people think, uh, uh, the Parti Québécois is, uh, does, the, 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 there, there's no division between what was traditionally rural urban politics. I think as we know in Canada, uh, th th there's no such, well, th many districts are not totally rural and not totally urban. I think that's, that's, that's the new reality, I think. Uh, uh, most voters live in, uh, in, in urban areas and, uh, and it's a kind of, uh, uh, of, of people mixing and uh, so we, there's no correlation if you say between whatever you describe as a rural vote versus an urban vote, it doesn't work in Quebec politics at, at least that there, there's no such, uh, uh, this is not an important variable in terms of uh, predicting the outcome of the election. So, so the, the strength of the Liberal of course is getting the west part of Montreal that give them already 25, 30 seats, so they have to win another uh, 35 to get a majority. Uh, so the last election they got uh, 70 uh, seats. So that's 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 part of uh, of the political game. But but it become more and more difficult for political scientists to predict the outcome of elections. Okay, and we've got time for for one more question. There are lots more on our blog at provincialpolitics.blogspot.ca, uh, so I'd point folks there to uh, add to the debate. But to, just to close, because we haven't talked about uh, language uh, no. politics, uh, except for a, a brief comment that you had about um, language acts not being an issue in the last particular provincial election. But historically, I mean, we we've heard a lot of debate about. Um, the need to protect uh, the French language when it comes to things like education. At the same time, we know that globalization isn't slowing down any, and there are increased pressures uh, on the Quebec government, on Quebec society, Quebec businesses, um, that, that could have the potential of lessening the power of the French language. What's your sense? Is this is this going to be a salient issue over the next election, election cycle, or, or are we just going to keep the laws the, the way that they are? I don't think nobody wants to touch the law. I think clearly the Liberal Party nor the PQ, nobody will touch this legislation. The question is more about uh, uh, the Montreal issue. Of course, with the arrival of a uh, lot of immigrants and other people, Montreal becoming more international. So we have seen in the recent year kind of uh, uh, erosion, I would say, of the French uh, on the signs and the way you get business and everything. But Montrealers are all Montrealers are mostly bilingual. They've been trilingual. Uh, kids are learning in school, and that was a PQ initiative, uh, Spanish. So, uh, so in my class at Concours, the students speak uh, quite often more than two languages. Uh, rarely, I see even an Anglophone not be able to speak uh, French. Uh, it's 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 becoming it's a new generation, you know. It's a and and we have told them that uh, French, English are business languages. If you want to do business in the world. French is still on the top, even uh, uh, among the business languages. We forget about that. Uh, uh, that's why the Quebec government uh, invested a lot in uh, some African countries, uh, uh, because there's a growing population there. There's a lot of uh, potential for, for energy and other uh, other commodities that can, and I think strong relationship with those countries. Uh, the, the language, um, my big surprise, uh, just to be frank, is that the last election and the PQ did not even raise these questions. Uh, 
uh, there is some concern among the, the, the rank and file. Uh, people have quite often equate the language with, with PQ, but it's it's not where, where the PQ is now. Uh, uh, just to remind you, Mr. Barrasso passed Bill uh, 78. Mr. Ryan, really, with his legislation, Bill 86, really settled in many ways the, the, the issue uh, at the time. And uh, and I would say in the last 20 years, it's relatively calm. Even if we have reports, even from uh, Graham Fraser, uh, uh, where sometimes he is concerned about, for example, the use of, uh, if Canada is a bilingual country, the use of uh, French in, in Air Canada and other things. So. So, so this is still, I think, it's a Canadian issue, but it's also a Quebec issue in the sense that here in Quebec, I think, and partly in Montreal, uh, uh, the, the, the difficulty, I will tell you, I think, when you go outside Quebec, many Quebecers are concerned of coming to Montreal now because they feel, well, say, oh, Montreal has become more and more uh, international and, and Anglo English seems to be spoken more. And, and some people are afraid of coming uh, even from Quebec City to Montreal. They say, well, we have to be bilingual. Also, the fact that for business reasons, as you mentioned, I think with globalization, trade with the U.S., uh, uh, English is also... Uh, nobody in Quebec never questioned that, that we have to be... Uh, the, the bilingualism is, a, is an asset. Speaking French is a great asset as well, I think, and speaking more languages is an important uh, tool. So... Uh, I tried in my some of my research, some of the survey I did. Uh, um, uh, if Quebecer were francophone in North America, I will say until the mid 70s. What we have observed in the last 20 years is that Quebecers have become first North American speaking French, and that's a real transfer in terms of from a sociological perspective. Quebecers perceive themselves as North American, and 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 they are at the same time very very. Uh, uh, Maybe it's it's kind of mid, but at least they they, they are confident about the role of uh, the, the the French fact and the survival of the French. The reasons for that are very simple: is that we have seen all of these Quebec artists uh, uh, speaking French, Arcade Fires, the Cirque du Soleil, Céline Dion, and all of them. We can name all of them. I, I don't want to go into the uh, just uh, it's, it's, it's whole politics maybe, but it's. It, it just gave show that the confidence that people have in Quebec uh, that our culture can be an international culture and can be, and 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 this is the originality of Montreal and Quebecers. I think uh, their capacity to adapt themselves in a French environment and at the same time uh, having a global uh, identity. I think that's the two goes together, and uh, there's uh, that's why there's a that strong feeling. Uh, uh, there's less another point maybe there's less anti-Americanism in Quebec than probably in other provinces. That's a fact that always puzzled people. It's simply because many Quebecers have relatives living in the U.S. who left probably uh, uh, at the beginning of the last century and, uh, and live in the United States. So, we, so, so the contribution of Francophone to the development of North America is some, it's sometimes a bit forgotten, but uh, uh, but for Quebecers in general, that's that kind of confidence. And and uh, the project, Mr. Uh, if you read Le Devoir tomorrow morning, there's an interview with Mike Dukakis. He's coming to the World Congress uh, next week in Montreal, the, uh, and he is pushing hardly for a fast train between Montreal and, and Boston. Uh, so that's a kind of project that appeals to the business community, uh, to, to people that we have to move in this direction like other European countries. So, so this is the, the mindset of Quebecers now is let's be North American, we support a free trade, and let's pursue our uh, and, and let's bring our identity uh, abroad. And, and, and again, maybe I don't answer directly your question about the French itself in the daily practice. Of course, we, it's, it's, uh, it's important, I think, that we preserve that kind of uh, French identity of Montreal, and I think that's where I think most political parties agree on that. I don't think there's real disagreement on that. Perfect. Well, thank you, Guy. And I know that you're, you're heavily involved in, in organizing that particular congress. Uh, it's next week, I believe, in at Concordia. Is that right? Uh, it's at the uh, Palais de Congrès in Montreal. We are expecting uh, 3,000 people from 80 countries. Uh, so it's uh, the World Congress. It's, uh, it's always a huge congress. Uh, last time was in uh, Quebec City in 2000, and in 1973 it was at at the time Sir George Williams in Montreal. So uh, so uh, this time it's it's in uh, in Montreal and. 2016 in Istanbul and 2018 will be in Brisbane in Australia. So, so we are moving ahead. I think the uh, we have a, a great uh, community of political scientists in Canada. Uh, 
Uh, I look up the numbers, there's over uh, 450 kidneys coming, uh, over 3,000, and that's the largest group. So, uh, uh, and uh, we have American colleagues. Uh, so all of these colleagues are coming from all part of the world, and we have a good team. I think the question, and that's that thing an issue in, on politics is about the uh, governance in general, and how can we, how governance can, how can we be better governed essentially in, uh, all over the world. Well, we'll be tuning in from afar on media, and I'm sure on Twitter there'll be a lot of traffic there. So thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know we covered a lot of ground here, and again, I'd point folks to provincialpolitics.blogspot.ca to carry on the conversation. We didn't get to all of the discussion. I know there's some questions, for example, about Aboriginal politics that we didn't touch today. Um, but Not I'll leave much, that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but everybody can write to me on my uh, to key dot. Lachapelle at Concordia.ca anytime, and I'm, we'd be pleased to answer all questions. Perfect. Thanks, Guy, for taking the time. We'll talk to you soon. Good luck. Thank you, Jared. Bye. Bye.